Do you know the difference between being raised to life and resurrected? Do you know how many resurrections there are? When will the first resurrection take place? And do these questions really matter? Let's talk about it. Hey, this is Off the Cuff, and I'm Steve from TorahFamily.org. When talking about the resurrection, I've had many people tell me how they believe Yeshua resurrected many people from the dead during his ministry. And so they believe those miracles Yeshua did were considered resurrections. This is where we need to understand the difference between being raised from the dead versus being resurrected. You see, one who is raised from the dead will undergo another physical death, as in the case with Lazarus. Yes, he was raised from the dead. But even after Yeshua raised him from the dead, he still died a physical death again. However, at the resurrection, one is given a new body, an incorruptible body, one that won't experience a physical death ever again. Paul discusses this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 42. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Notice he said, if there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body, showing all will be resurrected, both the righteous and the unrighteous. Everyone has a natural body. Thus, all will have a spiritual body just the same. Just as Yeshua now has a spiritual body, one that can be felt, as the disciples felt his hands and sighed, as seen here in Luke 24, 39. A body that can consume food, as seen here in Luke 24, verses 40 through 42. But his body can evidently walk through walls just the same, as seen here in John 20, verses 19 and 26. Also seen in Luke chapter 24, verse 36. Everyone will have a body like this at the resurrection. Paul discusses this earlier in the same chapter. Verse 20, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. He says, all will be made alive. Thus, his words in saying, if there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. All will be made alive with a spiritual body. In fact, this is further established in Acts 24, verse 15, where it says, And I have the same hope in God as these men, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and and the wicked. Again, showing all will be resurrected with incorruptible spiritual bodies. It's the next verse in 1 Corinthians 15 where we see the order given. Verse 23, but each in his own turn, Christ the firstfruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him, then the end, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. So right here we see the order of the resurrections. Yeshua, the first fruits. Then what is commonly referred to as the first resurrection at Yeshua's coming. And then at the end when he hands everything over to the Father. Now, please notice I have will come crossed out in this verse. That's because it doesn't exist in the Greek. The Greek literally says, then the end, when delivers the kingdom. 
this takes place at the end of the millennium, thus the last resurrection happening at the end of the millennium. Verse 25 then says, For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Thus, all who are not in the first resurrection will be resurrected at the end of the millennium. If any physical body remains in a physical state, then death has not been conquered. Regardless, if the body had become ashes and blown away in the wind, burned up and turned to gases, or even swallowed by animals or fish, the physical state of that body was only changed, and death would still be reigning over that body. Thus, verses 25 and 26, Death will no longer have its reign when all are resurrected with incorruptible bodies. Thus, verses 53 through 55 in the same chapter, which says, For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? This is directly referencing the last resurrection and not the first resurrection that is coming. Death will be reigning over the dead during the millennium who were not in the first resurrection. As long as there is a dead body in the ground, death is reigning. But at the end, death is destroyed through the last resurrection. That's why verses 25 and 26 says it's the last enemy to be destroyed. Notice here in verses 37 and 38 how Paul likens the resurrection of the dead with harvests. This is important to note. Just as Paul shows three resurrections, we see three harvests throughout the year. In fact, the three resurrections are directly tied to the three yearly harvests. Thus, they'll happen in the same order as they naturally occur as Paul referenced them. Early spring, early summer, and early fall. The physical, that being the times of the harvests, show the spiritual, that being the times of the resurrections. We know Yeshua. The first fruits of the first harvest has already happened, early spring. So, there are two resurrections to take place still. Two resurrections that are in line with the remaining harvests just the same. The next will be at the time of his coming. What Yeshua even titled the resurrection of the righteous in Luke 14, 14. Thus, only the righteous are resurrected at his coming. Those longing for his appearing. Yeshua makes this distinction between the resurrection at his coming from the last resurrection at the end. At the last resurrection, the righteous who lived through the millennium and the wicked who lived throughout all time are resurrected together, whereas the first resurrection at his coming consists only of the righteous up to that time. As Yeshua always gave his parables and illustrations with real-life circumstances, we see the resurrections will happen in the order of real life just the same with the harvests. There are many assumptions as to when the next resurrection will happen. <laughs> we have several theories that we always keep in mind and watch for every year. Our top two, though, would be that of Shavuot and the Day of Atonement. However, when it comes to the given numerical order connected with the three harvests and patterns of biblical history, Shavuot is always our first consideration. Besides Shavuot lining up with the next harvest for the resurrection, we know the first two harvests have a first fruits presentation, that which is made on what is traditionally called the day of first fruits, and then 50 days later on the day of Shavuot, also known as Pentecost. Yeshua was resurrected as the first fruits offering at the first harvest, seen here in 1 Corinthians 15:20. Ironically, we also see the 144,000 
offered as a first fruits offering, seen here in Revelation chapter 14, verses 3 and 4. When would that happen? Well, since Yeshua was the first fruits offering in the early spring, they would be the first fruits offering on Shavuot, keeping in line with the natural harvest and biblical timeline of the holy days. But Shavuot lines up with more than just the natural cycle of the harvests and the first fruits offerings. It lines up with patterns given to us in biblical history, too. So, What happened in biblical history that points to the next resurrection? Paul said we would be caught up together with Yeshua in the clouds at the next resurrection, at the time of his coming. We see here in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 14 through 18, several elements that need to be noted. First, he comes down from heaven, and he's in clouds. There will be a loud command. There will be a trumpet call, and there's an ascension and gathering in the clouds. Where do we see these exact elements all together in biblical history? You guessed it, Shavuot, seen here in Exodus chapter 19, verses 16 through 20. What do we see? He comes down from heaven. He's in clouds. There was a loud command. There was a trumpet call, and There's an ascension and gathering in the clouds. Moses even discusses the account again in Deuteronomy chapter 5, declaring how the people heard the commandments in a loud voice coming from the clouds. This is absolutely huge. This is the only place you'll find in all of biblical history that lines up with each element to what's given to us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Not only this, please notice verse 17 in the Exodus 19 account. It says Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God. Remember, this was the day before Shavuot, the day before the covenant was made. Why is this significant? Consider what Yeshua said regarding his return. Regarding the parable of the ten virgins, he said, At midnight the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom come out to meet him. They were to go out to meet him. Now, look what he said regarding his return in Luke 17. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, no one who is on the roof of his house, with his goods inside, should go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Yeshua says, when we see him, there's action required on our part. Action described with the parable of the ten virgins. We see him revealed. We hear the call and go out to meet him. An exact parallel with the people going out to meet with Yahweh at Mount Sinai at the timing of Shavuot. So we see there will be action required on our part when Yeshua appears. But not just action immediate action, just like with Shavuot at Mount Sinai. At that time, he delivered his people out of Egypt. This time around, he delivers his people out of Babylon. But this time, the plagues come all at once and at the time of the deliverance. In fact, according to Isaiah, the deliverance comes immediately before the judgment. This is covered in our teaching titled, The Birth Pains. Again, the deliverance comes immediately before the judgment, as seen here in Isaiah 66. In fact, we see this deliverance at the command to immediate action given right before Babylon's destruction in Revelation 18. Come out of her, my people. In Revelation 18, verses 1 through 3, we see judgment declared on Babylon from the angel, followed by the command to come out of her in verses 4 and 5. Thus, two voices are heard. Thus, the two voices heard in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16, the angel and the command to come out. Then, 
judgment is immediately issued in verses 6 through 8 in Revelation 18. Thus, deliverance immediately before judgment. Another parallel with Shavuot out of Egypt is how that was a new covenant being established under Moses. And what are we waiting for? The marriage of the Lamb. The new covenant through the prophet likened unto Moses, Yeshua, which happens to take place immediately after the destruction of Babylon in Revelation 19. Many hold that Shavuot has already been fulfilled by way of Acts chapter 2. However, it's not been fulfilled yet. Acts 2 was just a deposit guaranteeing what's to come, as seen here in 2 Corinthians 1.22, 2 Corinthians 5.5, and Ephesians 1.14. So, what's to come? The new covenant, the marriage of the Lamb, and that's exactly what Shavuot represents, a marriage covenant. Ezekiel 36, verses 24 through all of chapter 37, shows the law being placed in our hearts at the time of the resurrection. The new covenant happens before, or at the start of the millennium, as Ezekiel describes the surrounding nations see it in verse 36. Chapter 37 shows this is at the timing of the resurrection, as it shows it being the same time he puts his spirit in us, as seen here in verses 12 through 14. Ezekiel 37 also discusses the two sticks coming together again at that time, as seen here in verses 18 and 19. And what do we see at the first fruits offering on Shavuot consisting of? Two loaves of bread representing the two houses of Israel coming back together on the day of Shavuot. The 144,000 represent all the tribes being reunited under Yeshua. Thus, the two sticks coming back together on that day. This all goes in parallel with Hosea chapter 2 verses 14 through 23 regarding the new covenant and being placed in the promised land as well. In fact, we see verse 15 here even references the time she came out of Egypt the time of the first marriage covenant. During the millennium, Israel will be the light to the nations as it's been called to be. And just as Yahweh called his people out of Egypt and entered into covenant with them to be that light, the same will happen when he pulls his people out of Babylon. He will set up his judges, shepherds, as seen here in Jeremiah 3.15. They will most likely be the 144,000 to rule. Because of the new covenant, they'll have the Torah in their hearts. Thus, they will rule in righteousness. So, in closing, there's a difference between being raised to life and resurrected. All will eventually be resurrected, the righteous and the unrighteous. There are three resurrections that match the three yearly harvests. Shavuot is the next in line regarding harvests and holy days to be fulfilled. The 144,000 match the first fruits offering to be made on Shavuot. In all of biblical history, only Shavuot in Exodus 19 gives us each and every element to what's given to us regarding Yeshua's return in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. In Exodus 19, we see an exact parallel with people going out to meet with Yahweh, as we see instructed by Yeshua when he appears. Acts chapter 2 shows the deposit given on Shavuot, guaranteeing what's to come, thus pointing to Shavuot for the new marriage covenant. And lastly, Ezekiel and Hosea prophesy the marriage covenant happens at the time of the resurrection. As you can see, Shavuot is definitely a time to watch. For more on this topic, you can see our teachings, the prophetic significance of Shavuot, images of Shavuot, Shavuot out of Egypt, and first fruits and Shavuot. Well, that's all I have. Think about it. Pray about it. But more than anything, be a doer of the word 
and not a hearer only. Until next time, Shalom.